Good morning, Living Grace. Brian, is it okay if I slide this over? All right. Been told a couple times I move around a lot when I speak, so, you know, we're on camera now, so got to kind of stay in the frame. Hey, it is good to be here this morning. It's good to get into the Word together, to dive into Scripture and to unpack it a little bit. I love the Bible. I love reading the Bible. I love studying the Bible. And the more I read it, the more intrigued I become about what the, these words on this page have to say about God, have to say about our world, and have to say about my place in all of that. And the more I read, and the more I think I know, maybe you feel the same way, the more questions I actually have. Do you ever feel like, like that? You, the more you know about a subject, the more you know about something, the more you realize, I didn't know. The more I know, the less I know, really, right? And the more questions we ask. Well, the thing about Scripture, to me anyway, is that there, there's so much there. We can't read this like any other book that's written in our language, in our culture, about relationships that we're familiar with. We've got to read Scripture through some different lenses. And a few weeks ago, I talked a little bit about that, about the ancient Near Eastern worldview. And we kind of have to, as we jump into Genesis again today, we kind of have to get in that mindset and kind of forget what we know about the world around us and look at the text for what it has to say to the people that it was saying it to. And when we do that, we look at not just the content of the text, but the structure of the text. And the way that it was, like the words that were used and the, the word play, how they interact with one another. We look at the structure, we look at the, the type of, you know, was it narrative, was it poetry? We, like, we've got to look at the text through all of these lenses to see what it was really trying to communicate. And when we read it, just kind of surface level, we actually cheapen what the Bible has to say to us, I think. And I've been guilty of that. When I sit down to read scripture without really first seeking the heart of God in the midst of it and asking the Holy Spirit to come and teach me and then pulling out commentary after commentary after commentary and reading book after book after book, which I'm not saying we do all the time, right? But it certainly helps to understand the text. Um, so today we're going to dig a little bit below the surface. We're going to dive into a passage of scripture, just one verse today. Jason gave me an entire chapter the last time I preached. Today he gave me one verse. And as we were, which is great, because as we were sitting down to talk about this series and how we were going to like divide it all up, we got to this verse and Jason says, isn't that what you have tattooed on your arm? Why don't you just preach on that verse? Like he just assigned it to me. And I said, I would love to. And at that moment, I'll be quite honest, this is one of those moments where at that moment I was like, I could stand up right now and preach on this verse because I love it. I've studied it so much. But in the last couple of months of digging in and studying more, there's so much more to it. And it's fascinating. And I, again, have more questions than I did two months ago on this passage that I've studied for years and years and years. It's one of those, those passages that just becomes more and more profound as we unpack it. And so we're going to do that this morning. Are you with me? Are you intrigued? Ready to go? All right, let's pray and we'll jump into it. Father God, we are thankful for the ways that you communicate to us through your spirit, through your written word, through the people around us, and even through creation. God, I'm, I've been blessed walking through this series and hearing uh, Jason speaking and, and, and speaking myself and all the studying that we've been doing. Um, God, it's been a blessing just diving into this this passage of scripture that really has opened so many doors and asks, causes us to ask so many questions uh, and helps us realize and recognize how big and great and powerful you are, but also how personal and intimate and compassionate and caring that you are as well. So God, as we jump into Genesis chapter 2, would you guide us. Would you allow my words to be your words this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so last week we wrapped up the creation account as told from Genesis 1, chapter 1, 
through Genesis 2, chap, uh, verse 3, chapter 2, verse 3. And now understand that there weren't chapters and verses when the text was originally written, so it was kind of broken down funky, but up to Genesis 2, verse 3, it's kind of all part of the same chunk of scripture, right? And we have this, uh, you know, in that process, we have this ordering of creation, the creation process, and then this ordering of all of creation so that everything works as it's intended. And God saw that it was good, and then he created man in his image, male and female, he created them, and he saw that it was very good, right? And then, you know, this, this series kind of follows this cycle of darkness and light, right? Day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. There was evening and there was morning the first day. And so we have this cycle of darkness and light, day and night, that kind of walk us through that God started an act of creation and God finished an act of creation. And then there was the starting and the ending of the next act of creation, right? And on the seventh day, God rested. That was what we talked about last week. God rested. Creation, the act of creation, and those first six cycles or six days was done, and God rested. It was finished. But then we get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and something is different. Actually, there's a lot different, and we're going to unpack a lot of those differences today. But starting with this sentence that says, Here's Genesis 2, 3, the end of the last one. God rested from all the creating he had done. He rested. Creation was done. But, now this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So it's like, we just told you all of this. God rested. Now I'm going to tell it to you again. Right? And then it goes on. Verse 5 says, Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. <clears throat> For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. And it continues, But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Now, if you were paying attention in the last couple weeks, you recognize there's a lot of differences in these first couple verses here of this next creation account. If you remember, God created light, and then there was water, and he separated the water, and then the land and vegetation came up, and then he started creating life. But in this account, it seems that man was one of the first creations, which we'll see in the next verse. He said, no, the stream started popping up, there was no vegetation, like all of that, right? Like it seems to be, it seems like the author wrote a first draft, turned it in, got it all marked up and read, wrote a second draft, and forgot to erase the first one, is what it sounds like to me. Like, you lay them next to each other, and the order's different, the language is different, the flow is different, but we have to understand that these were written as a cohesive unit. But if we don't get there, we're, we'll get there in a second, and we look at these, these differences, it can cause us to conclude a couple things. And this is where some people um, come to Scripture and they go, Scripture can't, these first two chapters of the first book of the Bible can't even agree. There's contradiction here. I can't believe this, right? So our first, the first way we could interpret this is maybe these are different stories, Maybe these are different stories that can't agree with one another. They contradict. And if they're different stories and they tell different, different stories and they contradict one another, which one's true? Which one can I believe? Maybe I can't believe either one of them. And if I can't believe either one of them or there's a contradiction right there, I don't need to believe the rest of the Bible because it can't agree with itself, right? I'm not willing to go there because I think there's purpose and intention behind it, which is what I want to talk about. So another option is that this passage in Genesis 2 is a close-up shot of day six of creation, when God created man in his image. So that's another option that I think is a very viable option, 
Um, we still have to wrestle with the order of creation that is a little bit different than in Genesis 1, but it gives us a close-up picture of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. When he says, let us make man in our image, Genesis 2 is like, this is how he made man in his image. Okay, does that make sense? Right? But there's another option, is that Genesis 2 kind of tells a special creation of this man, of Adam here. And this one may, this one's been playing with me a little bit, so I'm not ready to land on this one yet, but this is an option that some people say, you know, we interpret Genesis 1.26 as God created man in his image through Genesis 2.7 where he formed the man from the dust of the earth. And we go, oh, that must be what he did here. But the problem is there's no specific connection other than it's a few verses later. So some would argue that God created mankind and then he created a special man in this one. So again, that plays maybe a little theologically with us and I'm, again, not willing to land there, but just know that these are theologies, these are ideas that are out there. Now, we don't have time to dig into these right now, unfortunately. I would love to. The good news is that next week... Um, we've been asking if you have questions on any of the creation content that we've been talking about in Genesis 1 and 2. We'd love to answer some questions, or at least attempt, respond to some questions. So if you have questions today, um, go ahead and put those on your connection card. When you turn that in, if you're watching online, go ahead and uh, fill out the online connection card. You can put your questions there. Email Pastor Jason. Um, and we'll, we'll try and respond to some of those questions because there may be some that come up today. I'll be real honest. So, now, um, what I want to come back to is where I started, is that when we read Scripture and we start to really dig into it, we recognize, we have to recognize, it was written to a group of people in a time in history that spoke a language very different than our language, that had a worldview that was very different than our worldview. And when we start to peel back some of those layers and, and understand what was happening, we recognize that the biblical authors were brilliant. Brilliant in the way that they took complicated thought and complicated theology about their God and communicated it through the lens of the worldview and the culture and the language of the people around them. They weren't communicating to Living Grace Community Church in 2021. But it's hard for us to get into that place. So what I want to do is today is recognize that there are differences, and we'll pull out some of those differences between the Genesis 1 and the Genesis 2 account, but it was written as a cohesive unit, which means the author didn't make a mistake as he was writing these two things. It wasn't a first draft, second draft. These things go together, and they're meant to communicate something to us in the two different tellings of the story. So I want to dig into that today. And I want to look specifically at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is the one verse that we're going to talk about for the rest of our morning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And I want to just recap what I just read. Genesis 2, 4, and we're going to end in verse 7. Just to remind us of what we just read here. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the earth. And then we get to this verse. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In this one verse alone, just this one verse, we have all sorts of new things that were not present in Genesis chapter 1, in that creation account. We have new language, not Hebrew, like it's all written in Hebrew, 
but new concepts that he's introducing through the language, which we'll talk about. There's new vocabulary in here that wasn't present in Genesis chapter 1, and there's new imagery here that wasn't present in Genesis chapter 1. And so what I want to do um, for a few minutes is kind of dig into these differences here to see maybe what the picture of God and the picture of humanity that we're getting that may be slightly different or added onto our, expands our understanding of humanity in Genesis 1. So let's look at the language. Now, again, this is not, it's all written in Hebrew. This isn't like a different, like, spoken language, but the, the concepts presented in the language. In chapter 1, is pretty general. It's pretty general language. On day 1, God created light. On day 2, he created, or he separated the waters. On day 3, he created land and vegetation, but he doesn't tell us specifically he created elm trees and oak trees and tulips and roses, right? It's just general. He created vegetation. And then we get to days four, the sun, moon, and stars. Days five, the animals in the water, the animals in the air. And then day six is land animals, everything that moves on land and humanity. Really broad, general language. In chapter two, it gets really, really specific. It gets really, really specific, especially when it gets to the creation of humanity. In chapter 1, it's, let us make man in our image, so God created man in his image, right? And your imagination is left to play with that and go, how did he do it? Genesis 2 gets really specific and says, this is how God formed a man, okay? In chapter 1, it's plural, plural language, in all sorts of ways. So the creation of man, we get let us make man in our image, which Jason talked about a few weeks ago. Like there's different interpretations of what that even means. The word God that we'll talk about in a second, Elohim, is a plural Hebrew word, which plays with us a little bit when we begin to understand that. In chapter two, it's very singular. It was God created man in his image, God created a man in chapter 2. And it wasn't Elohim, it was the Lord God. So the, this particular, this singular God, this is what he did. So the language here is a little different. Let's get into some of the vocabulary that's different. What I just mentioned is the word for God is different in Genesis 1 and 2. Now I believe it's talking about the same God, but the difference is this God, the word is Elohim, and this one, it's Yahweh Elohim in the Hebrew. He's named here, Yahweh Elohim. Now, you may know this, maybe you don't. Here's a tidbit of information. As you're reading scripture and you see the word Lord in all capital letters, that's in Hebrew, that's the word Yahweh. You can see the word Lord in Scripture in other places that's not capitalized, that isn't talking necessarily about God. But when you see it in all caps, it's Yahweh. It's the name God gave to Moses and said, this is who I am. So Genesis 2 tells us specifically, Yahweh Elohim did this. It's a personal name. It's not the God that's up there somewhere. It's our God that calls us by name, that gave us his name, did this. All right? So in Genesis 1, we have words like made and created. In Hebrew, I'm going to butcher these words, but it's asa is the word made, and created is bara in Hebrew. Okay? So these are specific Hebrew words that mean specific things. But then in Genesis 2, we have the words that are translated in English, formed, which is yaser in Hebrew, and breathe, which in Hebrew is nafa. okay? So the words are different, which lends itself to some different imagery that we'll see here in just a second. And then in Genesis chapter 1, we have words like earth, land, and ground. It's all one word that's translated three different ways. Eres is what it is probably mispronounced that just now, and that's okay. You can check me online later. Um, but it's the word for earth, for land, for ground. And then we get to chapter 2, 
and we're introduced to this word dust. The dust of the ground, and that Hebrew word is afar, afar. So there's something specific that God's doing that's not just land, ground, earth, whatever. There's something specific that God's doing from the dust of the land, of the earth, of the ground. Still with me? Not boring you with all the language talk. All right, very good. All right, now we get into some of the imagery of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. So in Genesis 1, we see God kind of as the prime mover. Maybe you know that term if you took a philosophy class or anything, that God's the prime mover. He's the one that initiates everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God was the prime mover. He started it. He set it all in motion. And then each day, each cycle that we read about through Genesis 1, God said, let there be. God said, let there be. God said, let there be. And it was so, and it was so, and it was so, right? So God was the prime mover. He's the one that initiated every act in creation that we read about in Genesis 1. Which in Genesis 2 is still very true. But we see a picture of God as an artist here. In Genesis 2, we see a picture of God as a sculptor. As God creating something with his hands. Not speaking it into existence that we read about in the first chapter. God forming something with his own hands. There's a, there's a connection to what God is doing in Genesis 2 that we don't particularly see in Genesis 1. So Genesis 2 is expanding our view of who God is, but he's also bringing God closer to us in relationship and our understanding of that. Genesis 1 is kind of painted in broad strokes. We kind of talked about this earlier. It's general and specific. But as we look at God as an artist, maybe, Genesis 1 gives us kind of the, the broad strokes, like the base of the canvas. Like, um, you ever watch um, uh, Bob Ross, right? Paints the happy little trees, whatever, right? So this is him painting, like, the ground, broad strokes, and then the blue, and he's fading it all in, right? This is the backdrop of what he's doing. And then we get to Genesis 2, and then you get the little trees that he's painting, and the birds in the sky, like, you get the really fine details that really make the story pop, that really make things come alive. Because we have this picture of God as an artist in chapter 2. In chapter 1, chapter 1 is very pragmatic, meaning it's like really matter of fact, really practical. God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. Very practical, step by step, really logical, moves in order. But in chapter 2, as I've already mentioned, we see a God that's really personal. A God that's really personal, that's not necessarily concerned about, he's like, I already did all that. This is something different. This is something special. This is something personal that I'm going to step into and I'm going to get intimately, personally involved with. Not that he didn't in Genesis 1. We just don't read this into Genesis 1 because God spoke it all to being. Now, ultimately here, we get a picture of a God who is very personal. A God who is shaping dust or clay. There's some debate even there, just to tell you that. If we translate it as dust, you can't form dust, right? And other translators would say, no, that just means clay from the ground. There's water springing up and making the ground wet and moldable and workable, so... There's even debate on this here. Um, but a God who reaches down with his bare hands and he pulls out some dust, some clay from the earth, and he starts shaping it, and he starts forming it. You know, as kids, we played with Play-Doh, right? And I, if I was doing this with a group of students, you would all have Play-Doh, 
in your hands right now. And you would all be molding and shaping Play-Doh. But this is the image of God that we have. That he reaches down and he grabs a lump of it and he just starts molding it. Now, if you played with Play-Doh, it kind of gets all over your hands. Like, it leaves kind of a slimy feeling, right? Um, Imagine if you're playing with clay, with dirt. Like, your hands are dirty. Like, there is, there is an intimate connection. I can't just say, all right, be a snake. I have to actually, this is what I'm really good at, is just making it into a long snake, right? That's what we all did. God's getting his hands dirty here to create humanity in his image to be his representatives to the rest of creation. God said, I got everything right, but this one, I'm going to get really, really right. I'm going to do it myself, right? If you want things done, right, you got to do it yourself, right? You heard that. Um, Maybe not always true. In this case, I think it is. God says, I'm going to do this myself with my own two hands. And then we have this picture. Not only is God forming a man or forming humanity out of the dust of the earth, we have a picture of God that... He gets down on his knees, okay? And he's forming us. And it says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It's a really intimate picture. Have you ever given CPR to somebody? It's, it can be a bit awkward, right? In that moment that you're giving someone CPR, you forget about the awkwardness. It's more awkward when you're learning to do CPR and you've got the dummy laying on the table or maybe a live person that they used to, like, that's more awkward. But when it comes to crisis moment, you forget about the awkwardness, you go to action. But this wasn't crisis moment for God. This wasn't crisis moment. This This was God forming for the first time. We read later in Genesis that everything that was alive had the breath of life in it. So somehow, God gave the horses the breath of life. Did he blow into their nostrils? Probably not. Everything that has life has the breath of life in it, is what Genesis tells us. But in this case... God imparted his own breath into humanity, and I think there's something really significant about that as well. When you are giving CPR, why do we do that? Why do we, I'll just ask that question. What is, what is it about CPR? When you're blowing in someone's mouth, what are you doing? giving them life, right? They've stopped breathing. Maybe their heart stops. So you're pumping on their chest and you're trying to give them life and you're breathing into their mouth and you're trying to give them air, right? So what you're doing in that moment is you are taking life from yourself and breathing it into another person. In Genesis 2, God forms a man. Hands on, hands dirty, personally, intimately, but he's still a lump of clay. God breathes his own breath. Nefesh. Nefesh is the word here. Breathes his own breath into the man. And when that happens, man becomes a living being. Man becomes a living being. That's the word. I mixed that up. That's the word. Nefesh is living being. Neshama is his breath in Hebrew. He breathes his breath, and when he breathes his breath, this lump, this inanimate lump of clay, piece of Play-Doh, God breathed in, and he rose up and became a living being. There's something significant and special about all of this that we learn only in Genesis 2 that is kind of glossed over in Genesis 1. So we could unpack this all day, and I would love to do that. But I'm looking at the clock, and I'm going, you guys are probably getting hungry. Not going to do that to you. But again, if you have questions, want to talk more about this passage, 
Anything we've talked about so far through Genesis 1, next week is an opportunity. Write those questions down so we have an opportunity to kind of dig into them and give you a real answer instead of on the fly next week, which maybe you can do that too. Um, But we'd love to hear it. We'd love to hear it. But what is it for now? What does this mean? What can we take away from this passage today? There's a laundry list of things, but I'm going to give you three. I'm going to give you three that humans are unique among all creation. Humans are unique among all creation. We probably would, we've heard that all our lives if we grew up in church. There's something special about humanity, right? But this is where all of this comes from. Just a couple of verses in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and Genesis 2, 7. That God created us differently than everything else. And it was personal, and it was intimate in the way that he did it. It's the image of the potter and the clay. And we see this image throughout the rest of Scripture, too. Paul talks about it in the New Testament. Isaiah talks about it. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work. We are all the work of your hand. It's a common theme that plays out all through the rest of the Scripture that starts right here. God took a personal interest in humanity among all creation. This next one might play with us a little bit, too. Still playing with my mind a little bit. So humans are created as mortal beings. Hmm. That's a challenge, right? Because if our theology tells us death didn't enter the world until Adam and Eve sinned, man was created immortal. Man was created to live with God forever, therefore he must be immortal. I think as we dig into this passage, we see that God created humanity from already created things. It wasn't an immortal creation, something new. God created us from something that was already created that wasn't intended to be forever. And then we read in Genesis 3.19, it says, For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And you might say, oh, but that's after the fall. That's after sin. That's after they ate from the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. So now, therefore, you were returned to dust. But if we look at Job, Job chapter 10. Now, Job is, shows up much later in our Bible, but Job is widely understood as maybe the oldest book of the Bible, written before the Genesis account of creation. And Job tells us in Job 10, 8, 9, he says, Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? So Job, the oldest book in the Bible, is talking about this too. Now again, Job's after the fall, but Job talks about returning to dust. Now, here's where I think this, this really comes alive for me is that in the garden and Jason will talk about this in a couple weeks so I won't go too much into it in the garden there were two trees the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they were told not to eat from and the tree of what tree of life if man was created immortal what was the purpose of the tree of life You're free to eat of any tree, including the tree of life, to sustain your life, to sustain you for all of eternity. But you need this. I'm going to provide this. It gives us a picture of God that says, you're created mortal, but I want you to exist and coexist with me for eternity, so I'm going to provide a way for that to happen. What happened after the fall is that they were excommunicated from the garden and lost access to the tree of life cutting off their eternal connection with God that then Jesus provides later for us still playing with me I'm still wrestling through the implications of if this is what it is I think this is what this is teaching that there's a dependence a built in dependence 
on the way God made us, on him to provide and sustain us for eternity. This one's a little easier maybe than that one. Humans are intimately connected with God. Intimately connected with God. Not because he, he formed us and made us and shaped us, but intimately connected because the breath in our lungs that we just sung about is the very breath that God breathed into us. It was his life being breathed into us that made us come alive. Our lives, our identity, and our eternity is fully dependent on the creator God who made us. In his image, who formed us from the dust of the earth, who breathed into our lungs his own breath that gave us life. Now as we look back, we understand that Adam and later Eve, as she's created, uh, from Adam later in this account, that these are kind of archetypes of us. Like we weren't physically, literally, God didn't reach into the earth and form us. We were made and formed and shaped in our mother's wombs. Psalms talks about that, Psalm 119. But we are part of Adam. We are part of Eve. And the breath that we carry is the same breath that God breathed into their lungs. We are made of the same stuff, the same substance that Adam and Eve are made of. So Adam and Eve, real people, at a real time, in a real history, of a real God that shaped and formed them, are part of who we are, and what God imparts to us in his own life, so that we can be living beings, enjoying a personal, intimate connection with the God of the universe, now, through his son, Jesus. Fun? Questions, maybe? All right. In a few weeks, we're going to talk about what happened next. When God formed the man, it said he placed them in a garden. A garden on the east side of Eden. And he gave them a role, and he gave them a responsibility and I think that all stems from what we talked about today. So we're, we're going to get into that a little bit later. But now I want us, we're just going to engage in a, in a time of prayer. And what we did leading into the message before the song is we focused on the greatness of God. The greatness, the power, the majesty of God who can speak all of this into existence. Who can order the world so it, it works as it's intended to work. But we now have a picture of a God who's personal, who's intimate, and who wants to be close with us. So I'll, what I want to do is just take a minute and connect with the heart of God. We focus, we praise God for his greatness and his creation. Let's, let's invite God into the, the intimate spaces in our hearts right now. What are you experiencing in your life? What are you going through? What are you wrestling with? What are you excited about? We have a God who rejoices when we rejoice and who mourns when we mourn and who weeps when we weep. It all stems from the way that he made us. He wants to be close. He wants to be with us. So take a minute, 60 seconds, literally, and connect with the heart of God. Invite him into that space, and then I'll close us in prayer. <laughs> 
God, our creator, Elohim of Elohim, Yahweh Elohim, God with power, God with might, but God with compassion, God with care, God with concern, God who is personal, God who is intimate, God who wants to be in relationship with each one of us. We stand in awe of you right now, God, that as big as you are, as majestic and as powerful and as great as you are, you come close. You come close. We see this, God, in creation as you breathe your life into humanity. That's where the relationship began, God, and that's where the relationship will end as we one day will walk side by side with you as creation is remade in such a way that we can be with you without separation, without sin, without death for all the rest of eternity. God, we, we thank you that though you excommunicated mankind from the garden, removed access to the tree of life that you would provide to sustain us, that you provided another way, a better way, and now the only way to be in that intimate, close, personal relationship with you through your son, Jesus. God, thanks for stepping in. Thanks for stepping close. I don't know what the prayers out there were this morning, but God, I'm thankful that you rejoice with those who are rejoicing. I'm thankful that your heart breaks for those with broken hearts right now. I'm thankful, God, that you step into hard places that we're dealing with in our lives, with our families, with our jobs. Continue to lead us, continue to walk close with us, God, and I pray that we would have the courage and the wisdom to continue to invite you into that. In Jesus' name, amen.